So now on to our guest. I'm so excited to hear uh, what she has to say. Yeah, uh, Sarah Shaw. And as I mentioned before, she's a celebrity designer. And we really need to hear about your handbag uh, stories because that is absolutely fascinating. She specializes in product placement with celebrities, which if you're an entrepreneur, oftentimes is one of the best ways to uh, get recognition uh, for your product. And if I can just take a little bit of a sidetrack here, Gerhard Law had a client who, in, who in, engaged with uh, a superstar um, and they were able to uh, increase their sales almost uh, instantly. So it's a good business right. strategy. So Sarah, welcome to the show and uh, tell us your story and tell us about what you do. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here with you all today. So my career started way back in the late 1990s, uh, 97, 98, and I launched a handbag company um, sort of out of the blue. I'd been working in film doing costumes for movies um, right out of college. And I was having dinner one night with the costume designer that I had worked with for many years, and she was complaining and whining that she was being forced by the studio to use Donna Karen clothes on one of her actors. And that's when my light bulb went off for me. And I thought, oh my God, I'm such an idiot. Why didn't I ever think of gifting celebrities or getting my products into movies, you know? And a lot of people have said to me, well, you had all these movie connections and you dressed all these stars and celebrities. And I was like, yeah, but I didn't have their phone number. Like it all went through casting. So we just showed, you know, we booked the fitting, they showed up. I never talked to them, you know, personally. And so, as soon as I went back to the office the next day, I decided to figure out how to contact celebrities because I thought if Donna Karen's doing it, other people are going to start doing it right away and I need to get on this bandwagon because nobody else was doing it yet. And this was probably 1999 maybe or early 2000. And but there was, you know, not everybody was online at that point. There was no contactanycelebrity.com which you can easily find celebrity contacts nowadays. So, you know, this was kind of, you know, 411 <laughs> and figuring out, you know, which agents represented which actors and kind of going the old school route. But I started to make some connections pretty quickly and sending um, product to celebrities. And actually, Liv Tyler, who was a um, pretty big star back then from Dawson's Creek and different shows, and she actually showed up in InStyle magazine holding one of the bags that I had sent to her. And that was really the first celebrity placement that I ever had. And it was amazing. I started thinking, how can I make money from this? So making copies of the magazine, sending it out to potential stores that I wanted to get into. But you got to keep in mind, stores mostly still weren't online at that point. They didn't even have an email address. So it was printing it, packaging it, mailing it to the store, calling, you know. So it was very old school. And I've kind of been through. That seems like <laughs> through. so far so, so long, so long ago. ago. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it was only about 21 years ago. <laughs> so I mean, which does seem long, but it's been amazing, like over the years to see the uh, evolvement of that for me, right? I think, you know, when I work with clients now, I'm like, ooh, push a button and everybody gets to know what you want to say in one second, right? So when, do, do you actually get to meet any of the stars that are using the handbags then? No, I, I never did, um, you know, and, and it was for me, it was really just a vehicle to get more sales. Right. And as we started to get more celebrities um, product and they started showing up in magazines or magazines wanted to just write about it because it was fun and interesting at that point, but just because no one was doing it right. It was all brand new and a new way to market. Um, and then I started reaching out to films and that's when things really changed. I um, got in touch with Sony and asked if they were making any movies that needed bags. And they were like, oh, well, there's this film called Legally Blonde. <laughs> we didn't know what it was. And um, they, they, it's a bunch of college girls, so maybe they could use bags. And they connected me to the costume designer and she's like, sure, bring them over. So I loaded up my car and just drove a ton of stuff over there. They picked a bunch of bags. I don't know, I left 30 or 40 bags. So it was a pretty big investment because I made my bags in Los Angeles at the time. So just left all this stuff and had no idea what was going to happen. And then they ended up using one of my bags in the film and it actually ended up being the publicity shot for the movie. 
So that wow. was total luck. <laughs> well, and I, yeah. So I want to ask you, so you had bags that you did, but now you're placing all sorts of products, right? These days I do. Yep. So I use basically what I learned building my own brands. Um, I had my handbag company and then after 9-11, my investors pulled out and I actually had to close the next year. Um, but then I patented. I've owned a patent for a while. <laughs> now wow. it's expired. <laughs> I patented a closet organizer for handbags in 2003 and then sold that for many years, licensed it, got it to celebrities, got it in magazines and was very successful with this one product in 12 colors. And in the first two years, learned, do, using everything I'd learned over the five years with my handbag company, did half a million in sales from 2006 to 2008. Um, with this one thing. <laughs> and wow. so Sarah, can I ask you a question? First of all, is there like a range, a financial range for getting a product placement like this? And then is there a way to measure the ROI on celebrity uh, endorsements? Okay, so let's swing back to the word endorsement first, because endorsement indicates that you're actually paying for something right? You're actually doing a money exchange. Personally, I've never paid to ever have a celebrity use or wear my product or be in any movie. I just had to give the stuff away. So you're investing the cost of your product. These days, a lot of celebrities will just take the gift for free. Um, a lot of times they'll just post it now with Instagram, right? It's so easy to say, oh, hey, look at this cute thing I just got, right? You know, I just was gifted this. It's so, I love it. Um, Sarah Jessica Parker, for example, is really good at posting things on her Instagram that she gets. And she just does that for free. There's no charge associated. But lately, I've been working with some of my clients to actually do some endorsement deals. And the way that we're, we've been trying to work it out, because they are small brands and can't afford to pay, you know, 50 or 250,000 to the celebrity to talk about the product is offering them a percentage of sales. I know handbags are big, especially in movies for women, but what other kind of consumer products are good for product placements? If I were an entrepreneur with a consumer product company, what, what would be my best bet for getting it placed somewhere? Well, it you really want to, let's say you wanted to get on a TV show because it's really hard to, to figure out what films are being shot or what's upcoming with movies, unless you can get in really tight with the product placement department on films, but often they're asking for money up front, right? You have to pay. But if you kind of circumvent all of that, let's say you wanted to get some clothes, for example, to a TV show and you think, oh, you know, this character would look great in this pink top. And, and so you could actually look for the costume designer's name in the end credits and see what their name is and then call the studio Warner Brothers or Universal or whoever's producing it and ask for the production office for that department or if you had candles or let's say it was a you know a show like cheers right with a bar all that they're in a bar all the time maybe you make a liquor and you want to get it on the shelf uh, maybe it's a show that takes place in a salon and you make a skincare product and they need product on the shelves so a lot of times you can just donate that to the and they'll show. just take it and, and, and use it. That's amazing. Yeah, exactly. Because I, I mean, the client that I'm thinking of, they hired Kim Kardashian, and I think they paid $10,000 for a single tweet with her holding the product. It's but it, it sent the sales <laughs> through the roof and the product ended up it was a lighted cell phone case. And exactly. it ended up in, you know, Verizon stores and Apple stores. And th that was the tweet that launched a thousand cell phone cases. Mm -hmm. And exactly. um, so anyway, so it's, 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 it's really cool to hear that they might do it for free. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, for a percentage of the sales, right. They kind of at that point put their money where their mouth is, right. I think I can sell this. So sure. I'll take 15 or 20% of your sales for the next six months or 12 months or whatever the contract deal is, you know, also if you're selling wholesale, right. Retail on your site, wholesale, to stores that can also lead to huge sales. Um, either getting in the media can can alert and be attractive to store buyers, right? You know, maybe um, you know you're looking to get in with a distributor and they see that you've had some celebrity placements because if you can also put a picture, right, a little framed photo of a celebrity with your product at the point of purchase, that totally drives sales. I used to send out 
you know, framed images of celebrities with my products all the time. Wow. So Kenya, I'm sure you have something to say about this. Well, it's interesting because I was thinking about the example you gave about Sarah Jessica Parker and the Manolo Blahnik placement in Sex in the City all of those years. Like I can imagine that she sold a lot of shoes for them based on oh, yeah. that kind of placement. So I'm not sure if Richard asked this um, early on, but like, what are some, like, what are some good product categories that do super well in a movie or in a TV show that, that generate a good return typically? Anything waste up (laughs) (laughs) just because, you know, um, it's like one of the costume designers I used to work with, he used to say, if it looks good on my 13 inch, that's what's going to sell because TV, if you notice is mostly waist up. So tops, jewelry, hair, accessories, glasses, um, any potential for patents and trademarks in there someplace? (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, Hey, I got my patented product to tons of celebrities. So, um, I never got it on a TV show, but I did get it in magazines too. Um, you know, and this was a closet organizer. So I kind of want to swing back to that. You were asking, you know, obviously nobody was taking it to the park with their kid, right? My closet organizer, it was in their closet, but magazines were still interested in the fact that I could get it to celebrities. And even if they put it in their closet and they couldn't show a photo of it, it didn't matter. You know, so if you make candles or soaps or, you know, bath and body products and you can get it to a celebrity and actually get them to request it again, that's sort of the secret to getting magazines to want to write about it because then it becomes a story and kind of a trend. Or if you get it to the same thing to four or five different celebrities and a lot of big brands do this, you know, all the couture lines, they'll send the same, you know, $25,000 handbag to 10 celebrities and then show that they're all, you know, wearing it on their arm and it becomes an instant trend. So you can create that same phenomenon with your own products, especially if it's something that's behind the scenes, right? Like, like your laundry, um, sheets, right? Nobody's going to be walking down the street carrying it. (laughs) But at the same time, every person does laundry. And there's a lot of celebrities, I don't know if it's an eco product or anything, but there's a lot of celebrities that, you know, would be interested in something clever and kitschy, you know, at the same time. Anything from the waist up. I never noticed that, but I'm sure you're I remember seeing a Coke can on the counter, but I also remember. <laughs> but see, so, I always thought they were paying. Coke was paying. I to have that. They they definitely are. Yeah, yeah. Okay. but 100%. I also remember. Do you remember back? And I'm aging myself. When E. T. came out and Drew Barrymore was the cute little girl in there. And now she has her own show. But mm-hmm. there was a big. So they lure the alien using Reese's pieces, and they first wanted to use M and M's, and M and M's said no. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Well, I remember reading about it, too, recently, actually, maybe a few years ago. Right. And Eminem thought they they didn't want to be associated with an alien. They thought that would turn people off. And Reese's Pieces (laughs) went through the roof after that, right? Exactly. Well, you know, it's like once I got my bag, when that when Legally Blonde came out and we could say, hey, here's our bag. And also all the publicity had come out. You know, we, we probably made quarter of a million off of those photos. If it's an historical thing, do you think fashion's changed too much so people wouldn't like look at the company again? Or do you think like if a movie from 20 years ago, your product was in there, somebody might revisit your product line? Oh, definitely. I mean, I I still use a lot of those images in Facebook advertising and um, other promotions that I do. And, and it's, you know, it's like, hey, I did it. You know, I mean, I have tons of, I had bags on Friends and Will and Grace and all these other TV shows that were super popular at that time as well. And I just don't talk about those as much as I, you know, making a bag for Julia Roberts for Ocean's Eleven seems, you know, I don't know, more fun to me. So um, yeah. you've had a, a lot of different businesses. It's, it sounds like at least a, a couple. Um, Six. Can you, can you tell us a little bit what it's like to be an entrepreneur? Um, and sort of, sort of the, the, the great moments and maybe the, the more difficult moments. Uh, a lot of our audience, I think, is asking themselves, well, I have an idea for a product or I have an idea for a service. I'd like to do this. What's it really like? It can be really scary (laughs) and thrilling. I mean, for me, you know, it's, I I think I'm a, um, 
a cautious entrepreneur in, in that I really like to test the waters to see if something's working before I just dive right in. Um, I, I started my first business aging myself way back in 1994, uh, making clothes for movies. Um, and you know, and when I started that first business, I had no idea about being an entrepreneur. I come from a long generation of entrepreneurs. I think I'm fourth or fifth generation that we can go back. Everybody in my family is an entrepreneur, but I was definitely never going to be one. I was going to work in film and die in film and everything. So, um, but when I started my first company, I was very cautious, you know, went out, went out to a couple of costume designers and people and said, Hey, we could, we can make these clothes for you for a lot less money than you're paying, you know, and it was, it was a very gentle start. And I really like to research and know my customer. And I think knowing your customer is one of the most important things about being an entrepreneur, but I think taking risks and being willing to kind of jump off the bridge at times when you need to is also a super important factor for being an entrepreneur and and also knowing when to give up on something. So, you know, I've had tons of failures <laughs> in my <laughs> life and tons of successes, you know, and it's been this fun roll, you know, up and down roller coaster. And I think you have to have um, a lot of backbone and be able to take a lot of rejection to be an entrepreneur and also learn from those rejections. As somebody once said to me that the biggest learning uh, moment can be when somebody tells you what they don't like about what you're doing mm -hmm. and that, you know, instead of immediately defending yourself, you know, well, but, you know, is just to be open and listen to that criticism because a lot of times there's a little bit of truth in it that if you don't, you know, put the wall down and <laughs> shove them away at that point that you can actually learn a lot and they may even give you some tidbit that could really help you propel and grow your business in a way that you just could never think about for yourself. So Kenyon, do you have a question? Yeah, Sarah, you had made a good point about like, um, you know, you've had some challenges and some failures. What are some signs that it's not a good business idea or a good venture? Uh, a, that you're not making any money. <laughs> Sometimes you are making a lot of money, but you're not making any profit. And so one of the things I highly recommend is that you examine your, especially if you have a hard goods, right? Service business is different. I've been in both. I've had hard goods and now I have a service business, which has very obviously little overhead because I don't retain anything. You know, I don't have an inventory. But when you do have a physical product, you know, a lot, what I learned was a hard lesson was that I wasn't pricing things correctly. And sometimes you underprice things because you think it will sell better at a lower price, but in the end, you're the only one who's being hurt by cutting those margins. So I think you have to put yourself first in saying, you know, what do I want to make from this or what do I need to make to survive? And then looking at, is it a viable product that you have, you know, at the price that you have to sell it for in order to be profitable. Right. I mean, I think that's really great advice. You know, start with the end in mind. If you're doing a, a lifestyle business where your goal is really just to provide yourself with a living, decide how much money you want to make and then work backwards from that. Right. Exactly. Right. Well, and I really like the advice that income does not equal profit. <laughs> so true. We can appreciate that on several levels. Um, well, it's funny. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's okay. true. It's profitability is important. So, right. Like I find that if you interviewed, a, a, you know, 10 different product based entrepreneurs and said, you know, what, what do you want to earn this year? Like, what's your goal? You know, they'll all give you big numbers. But then if you say, oh, you want to do half a million in sales, what will that put in your pocket this year as a salary? Not one of them can tell you. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and, I, I, and that's an important piece. Well, because it's yeah. always a juggling thing, right? So to get to those sales, you need the marketing. And then how much do you spend on marketing? And then how much do you get back? And the ROI on marketing a lot of times is so hard to calculate. So mm -hmm. it, it's always a juggle and, and it is hard to pin those numbers down, but you probably need to do the best you can, right? Yeah. There's a few mathematical 
things that I've made up over the years. Uh -huh. Because for me, the bottom line is you have to live and eat and support your family or whatever you're earning the money for, right? So, you know, if you need to make 50,000 as a salary, then it's easy to start to figure out based on your margins, how many stores you need to sell to or how many internet sales you need or whatever those hard goals can be. And then you can work backwards and break it down into how you'll achieve those. And I just think that one, going kind of back to your question before, one of the most important things about being an entrepreneur, I think, is breaking things down into small bite-sized morsels so that you can be successful every week. You know, maybe not every day, but then on Friday you can say, whoa, I had these two or three successes, or even if it was just one, something that will keep you going. Because it can get, you know, it can get really lonely being an entrepreneur. It can be really frustrating. You can feel defeated. You can feel elated. You know, there's it's such a roller coaster that I think the most important thing to keep yourself going is to have these little teeny milestones that actually make up your goal, right? So if you have your goal for the year, breaking it down by month and then week and then days gives you something to do so that every Monday you don't wake up wondering what you're supposed to do. You have this plan of, you know, I need three stores this week or oh, I need money, I better hold a sample sale online or, you know, whatever it is. You know, I remember waking up a lot on Fridays when I had my handbag company and like, oh my God, I have all these bills due. We better have a sample sale tomorrow, you know, <laughs> and sell some stuff. I got to raise some cash. I and think, I, yeah, I think I'm beginning to understand why you built that into a seven figure business. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so I think just keeping, you know, keeping everything realistic is really the the key to in my mind to the longevity of having a business because if you set these big goals like when i brought investors on you know they're like what are you doing you know and i was like oh gosh we're going to be selling to bloomingdale's next week and i was like how the heck is that going to happen you know i mean my partners were like you're going to be doing this and i was like how you know i don't even understand the process of it and so i think when you set these lofty goals I think that's great to have, you know, these dream stores up here, right? But, you know, department stores these days aren't necessarily the best way to go or a big box might not be what you can afford right now. Maybe you need to sell to 500 small stores to have that reassurance because if you sell to the big boys, they don't sell it, it's coming home. <laughs> and if you don't have anywhere to sell it, then you, you can go bankrupt overnight. So I just really encourage people to, chunk it down really tight, build their, build your brand slow and steady. And I think that's the, the kind of the ticket to longevity. Well, that's great advice. I, I, you know, another piece of it is that, that today business is so different than it was even 15 years ago. There's so many opportunities for automation and the consumer business, there's drop shipping and there's people who can take care of those kinds of things for you. And um, so it's, it's, it, I think it's worth some time making sure that you're educated on what the most current technologies are. And some of them may be impractical if you're a smaller business, but being on the edge of automation, I think can, can, is, is, is a good place to be uh, if you're an entrepreneur, because if it's done right, it saves a lot of time and a lot of money. Um, Elizabeth's brother-in-law, owns a, um, a hot uh, sauce business, right? And so his goal is to be able to run the whole business off of his cell phone. So, <laughs> you know, this is how things have changed. And, you know, he's pretty much there. So he just, wherever he wants to go, he just does the whole thing off of his cell phone. And um, so those are, there's lots of opportunities for efficiency. Definitely. And there, there's also a lot of noise because of social media now. There's so many, you know, so, so much noise out there, so many things to look at. I look at my Instagram feeds and my LinkedIn feeds, and I think celebrity endorsements are clearly one of the best way to cut above the noise because people pay attention to celebrities. And if you can get your product noticed, um, if you want to get your product noticed, I think celebrity is one of the best ways to do it. I agree. Mm -hmm. Say that, you know, I think about, I see a lot of cars 
now in terms of product placement where I didn't notice them as much before. I mean, that seems to be becoming a trend and a thing, especially when in TV shows and in movies. So I didn't know if you could speak to that a little bit. I know your, your the whole game is pretty much fashion, but like there's got, that's got to be a pretty big price point in terms of like getting a car inserted in a, a movie. Yeah. I mean, all those big brand things, you know, like when you see them open up a MacBook, you know, or a can of Coke or Pepsi or um, driving a specific car, right? Like that TV show Suits had tons of car placements, right? All the time. And you see big actors like Matthew McConaughey doing car ads and um, Olympic skiers now are doing some car ads, you know, that they're getting paid millions for that. Wow. Well, <laughs> it must work. Personally, it's, I wouldn't buy totally a car works. just because an Olympic star was in the commercial, but somebody must think it does and it must work. Definitely. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing it, right? Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I think, though, honestly, BMW has built their reputation on that kind of thing, honestly, because like if you see the the cool car, it's a BMW in so many different places and the hey, fast car and everything. You drive a <laughs> It worked on me. Yeah, it worked on you. <laughs> I tried a little black beamer, but um, I, I do think, that, and Mercedes, like they've built their reputation that way too. You drive up to some country estate, the little lady gets out of the back of the Mercedes, right? So I do think it works. Um, not everybody has millions, but. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we've had an absolutely fascinating discussion with uh, Sarah Shaw and uh, where can people reach you, Sarah? Oh, you can find me on my website at sarahshawconsulting.com and on Facebook at Sarah Shaw Consulting and Instagram at Sarah Shaw Consulting. That sounds great. And you also do a podcast for entrepreneurs, don't you? I do called Get a Street Smart MBA because that's what I feel I have. I do not have a business degree. I've learned it all on the main streets of the world. And it's fun. I interview a lot of high-end celebrities, um, Marcus Limonis, Damon John, Barbara Corcoran, and fashion designers like Trina Turk and Rebecca Minkoff and other fun people. Well, it sounds Excellent. great. And where can people find that uh, podcast? Uh, either on my website or on iTunes. That's great. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So we'll be right back after this message. You're listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt and our special guest this evening, uh, Sarah Shaw. And we have be right back after this commercial break. <laughs> 